Hello everyone, I'm Ashish Tarpari uh, from Axomize and I'm very happy uh, to be giving this keynote talk today. So very good morning to everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about um, a topic very close to my heart, uh, which is formal verification and I'll be talking about how to use formal verification to vaccinate chips against catastrophic bugs. So let's get started. Um, Okay, so the roadmap for, for this presentation is going to be, I'm, I'm going to give you a brief um, background of what Axiomize does, who we are, and then I'm going to take you into the world of chips. Uh, so I'll be talking about what a system and chip is, and then why correctness matters. And then I'll be giving a brief overview of formal verification. And then I want to talk about an exciting um, piece of case study that we have been looking at uh, in, the, in the world of processor verification and how formal verification can be used uh, to obtain rich dividends. <clears throat> so let's start. Um, so I'm founder and CEO of Axiomize. I started Axiomize in uh, 2018, February. I'm very happy to say I'm a global citizen. I was born in India uh, and I have been traveling around the world over the last uh, 22, 23 years. Um, I've studied and worked in three continents and five countries. And previously, um, I was at OneSpin Solutions, which is a German company that makes formal verification tool. Um, and I was the head of the product team at OneSpin Solutions before starting Axiomize. Uh, but prior to OneSpin, I was actually a user of formal verification technology uh, for for a very long time. I was at actually Imagination Technologies, and General Motors, ARM, and Intel. I have done a PhD in computer science in Oxford, they call it a DFL. Uh, the focus of my doctorate was in formal verification. And I was also a visiting professor at University of Southampton between 2015 and 2018. My expertise is in all aspects of theorem proving, property checking, and equivalence checking. So uh, the focus very much is on formal verification in its entirety. And I have been publishing papers and conferences and been filing patents. I've got um, 24 US and UK patents and formal and about 32 papers. So I've been busy uh, doing project work in different companies um, and I was also uh, enjoying myself uh, doing innovation. So the vision that I have for Axiomize is that we would like to be able to enable uh, predictable formal verification for all. Um, we don't want this field to remain specialized in the quarters of mathematics and computer science, but we want this to become mainstream in industry. We want all chip designers to enjoy formal and the idea is that if everyone was adept at formal, then they can avoid the bugs. So they, they will avoid introducing bugs in the design and they'll be able to detect bugs and erase bugs from the design and also prove their bug absence if they were all adept. So adept is also the name of an axiomized formal verification flow. And the idea is that you can tape out silicon without any bugs, so zero bug escapes. So how are we driving this change? So we build products and we write technical articles to educate our customers and students and anyone else who's interested in embarking on this fascinating journey. And for the last few weeks, we have also been doing regular podcasts. So our product portfolio is divided into four different groups. Uh, we focus on training, consulting, services, and proof kits. So they're all a little different, but they're all designed so that they can collectively uh, enable everyone who is interested in applying formal uh, to real designs in industry. So for example, if you're an engineer in an industry who wants to learn how to do it yourself, you can come and talk to us about our training program, which spans from one day to four days, depending upon which option you like. It is instructor-led, or it is face-to-face -face or online. And I go into extreme details, 
So it can be offered as a comprehensive course or it can be offered as a primer. Focus is on problem solving and methodology and is completely independent of any tool. On the other hand, if you were interested in engaging with us to understand how to roll out formal on your projects, we can engage with you in a consulting role or even in a services mode where we can actually take on the projects and execute them as turnkey uh, deliverables. But at the same time, if you haven't got the people to train and if you are actually interested in just um, enabling formal by asking us to come in and do the work for you, we can also offer you automated solutions such as these proof kits that we have started to develop last year. A focus right now is on RISC-5 uh, processor uh, formal verification, but the idea is to make formal so easy to use and automated that you can actually use it in a push button way. But we certainly don't want you to uh, only end up using it in that way. So this is why we are trying to provide a complete spectrum of um, options and product uh, uh, offerings so you can actually decide what works for you is best. Right, so as I said, we have been doing podcasts. So our podcasts have been uh, on for I think 14, 15 weeks. Um, they are available on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Amazon, on Instagram, and on YouTube. So you're welcome to follow us on uh, YouTube. Um, the idea here is we talk about verification-oriented topics, but also different uh, types of domain-specific uh, topics. So we talk about processors. We may talk about different aspects of chip design. And we regularly interview top and world-class experts as well. So you might find these interesting and educational even if you were not actually doing formal verification as a way to actually find out what the field of verification in general is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's dive into system on chip now. Mm -hmm. um, so system on chip, we will go into the details, but let's just take a step back and take a high level view. So we are living now in an age where all things are connected to each other. Human beings are connected to each other, devices are connected to each other, so we know this as a phenomenon of Internet of Things. Now, whether you are in an IT and networks area or a security, public safety area, retail area, transportation, industrial controls, healthcare and life science, consumer and home, energy or buildings, wherever you might be operating in, you would realize that actually a lot of this around you is impacted by technology, and by technology I mean hardware and software. So there's almost nothing that we do isn't touched by computers these days. So whether you are in the IT networks area of public and enterprise, or in the security of surveillance, or tracking a public infrastructure, or in the retail hospitality speciality area, you know, you pick, a, you pick something that you do and you would find that technology, hardware, software is necessary or driving it. And without this, we cannot function anymore. So our dependence on computing has been profoundly increased in the last two and a half, three decades, especially since mobile computing became pervasive. And now we can't actually do without computing. So the more you go out into the details and start breaking things down, you would see that whether it is the e-commerce data centers or IT data centers, fuel stations, almost everything is computerized, right? So now that we are living in this age, and this is um, a slide courtesy of Beecham Research, um, we're living now in this age that computing is now omnipresent, right? It's almost like a god. So how do we actually make sure that it doesn't actually have problems that can cause massive disasters? So we'll go into that, but I just wanted to bring to your attention that now we're living in a time when software companies have started to make hardware. So you can imagine how much hardware is playing a role that even the biggest names in the software houses have started to design hardware, whether it's Microsoft, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Alibaba, or Baidu. Um, 
And you can only imagine how hard it must be for software companies to be making hardware that Sundar Pichai recently commented that hardware is hard and it definitely has components which take real time to get it right. Thinking about underlying silicon or display or camera or any of those tacks. And it's quite obvious that his observation is actually um, not unique, although he has gone on public record saying that. But a lot of the people I interact with feel this. So what is a system and chip? What are we talking about? So this is um, courtesy of Tech Insights, a cutout of the latest Apple iPhone 11 Pro chipset. Now you would notice in this that, you know, this is the Apple A13 chip uh, with microprocessor in it. It's been manufactured by Samsung, uh, funny enough. Um, but it also is a collection, this whole chipset is a collection of different components from different vendors. So you've got an NXP display port, you've got a USB type C port controller from Cypress, you've got a Texas Instruments battery DC DC converter, you've got a lot of Apple proprietary hardware, but actually even the proprietary Apple hardware has processors that were designed or licensed by Apple from ARM. The technologies underneath is from ARM or Imagination it may be for GPUs. So. These are actually portable onboard computers. We're not talking about these tower blocks as PCs and desktop computing, but these are multi-core CPUs and GPUs. They've got a full-on power controller, display control, audio video codecs, baseband, Wi-Fi, and GPS. And the time to market typically for these chips is between six to nine months. And that's not a lot of time to be able to make the next generation um, chip Right. Um, so if you look at A13 in a little bit more depth, you will find that Apple claims it's got the fastest CPU they've made, the fastest GPU. It's got machine learning neural engines. It's got 8.5 billion transistors. Can you believe this? It's got 8.5 billion transistors squeezed in this die. Right. And they've taken between six to nine months, let's say, um, to to develop this. This is fascinating bit of engineering. And, um, and this is the kind of stuff that's actually now taking over our lives, not just the phones, but also the devices that are connected. Or when you're sitting in the trains, you know, the cameras that are watching us all the time. Um, so let us take even a step back and see what can be a system on chip if I was to teach somebody in a class. So at the very basic level, what you've got is microprocessors, we call them CPUs, graphical processing units, GPUs. We've got the vision devices that specialize in camera technology and image processing. We've got the networking components here under the radio block. We've got direct memory access controllers, DMA, that allow you to do input output with external world. And then you have an interconnect, a bus-like structure that connects these components to memories, to USB controllers, to I squared C bus controllers, Bluetooth, Ethernet, HDMI, whatever it may be. And the complexity of an SLC is not just in its interconnection of these components. Each one of these blocks that you see on the slide have tremendous complexity, both from a design point of view and verification point of view. So it's the verification of individual units, as well as the whole SLC, that has become the main focus point for, for the wider industry in terms of verification and validation. Just to give you a flavor, so if a, at a very high level you start from a new chip design from an architecture point of view, going all the way down to silicon, what you would notice is that at each level of abstraction, as you go down from architecture down to silicon, you have a lot of design choices that lead to optimization therefore leading to verification challenges. So at the very highest level, we have the instruction set architecture called ISA, verification challenge. We have to worry about security and power. We have to worry about multi-threaded uh, processor verification, safety, performance, area, arithmetic verification, a big problem, cache coherency for multi-cores. 
And as you go down in the architecture level, when you're starting to put together your designs, we're talking about arbitration being an issue because we're trying to compete for the same shared resource, multiple different design components. We've got serialization happening, blocks resets, hazarding, pipelining, deadlocks, live locks, and again, power performance area. And you would notice that power performance area are actually going all the way from the architecture down to silicon because power is basically dictating how much energy your devices are going to consume. Performance decides how fast or slow your device would be. And area basically says, can I squeeze these eight and a half billion transistors in such a small area? Because at the end of the day, when, when devices have become more mobile and smaller, we're trying to squeeze more and more elements of computation inside the same small area, but we want the same performance as we wanted from our desktop computers and we want these devices to run for longer and longer without having to recharge. So PPA, we call them in industry, has become a common theme, power performance area. And so is security and safety, and I'll go into depth of security and safety very soon. Now, in the abstraction layer, if you go from design microarchitecture, when you're getting closer to uh, getting your silicon out, what we create is called a netlist, which is a connection. It's like a graph of connected components where each logic gate and or not is connected to anything else like that. And this happens because we perform what we call a synthesis step on the Verilog or VHDL design models in which we write our designs at the microarchitecture level. And the synthesis verification then becomes a very important problem. So we want to make sure that the computer program that obtained this netlist gate level representation from your VHDL or Verilog programs is actually, has actually done this correctly. The problems of clocks and resets remains um, an important one all the way as soon as you bring clocks and resets is because there is this one clock that gets mapped into different design components. So there is this big huge tree of clocks and resets and we have to make sure that actually as they spread around like a tree we don't make mistakes in connection and that the clock frequency is still operating correctly. So you can see that actually some of the verification concerns might emerge from the architectural requirements, such as these, a particular inst instruction set architecture. But at the same time, there are lots of non-architecture specific requirements for verification. It could be arbitration, or it could be synthesis, or clocks and resets, or power performance in area. So we are actually talking about a whole layer of verification challenges. And this is why chip design and verification is hard. Okay, so let's talk about why correctness matters. Okay, so, and what happens when we get it wrong? So let me give you um, a few stories here. So I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but in um, 1994, Intel um, made an error in um, designing their Intel Pentium processors. So what happened is they built a processor that has had a bug in division. So the Pentium FDiv bug, which is, which is what it has come to be known as, was a bug which would actually calculate the outcome of a division on a floating point number incorrectly. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the occurrence of this error was not very common. It was actually uh, quite rare, but it, there were cases when it was returning incorrect results. And the bug was originally discovered in 1994 by Professor Thomas Nicely at Lynchburg College. And you can read about these things um, on Wikipedia and so on. In December 1994, Intel had to recall all the defective processors and in 1995, Intel announced a pre-tax charge of $475 million against earnings. And they effectively replaced all the processors in the world. The cost of this is humongous. It's not just bad PR or bad reputation, but the cost of the business is, is huge. And Intel actually made heavy investments in verification, specifically in formal verification and when I used to work at Intel, I was working in one of the labs after this event, uh, Strategic Cat Labs, which at the time, at the time was one of the best in the world. Um, now, 
It can also go wrong at a much bigger scale. This is the Ariane 5 rocket. And in June, 19, June 4, 1996, you know, an unmanned Ariane 5 rocket that was launched by the European Space Agency exploded 40 seconds after its liftoff. The rocket was on its first voyage after a decade of development that has costed the taxpayers $7 billion. The destroyed rocket and its cargo were valued at $500 million, right? And a board of inquiry, you know, um, investigated the cause of this explosion, and it turned out that the cause of the failure was a software error in the inertial reference system. And the error was that a 64-bit floating point number relating to the horizontal velocity of the rocket with respect to the platform was converted to a 16-bit sign integer. Now, these kind of errors we are catching day in and day out almost automatically with tools. But at the time, this wasn't being done in enough detail. And the result is in front of you. Let's talk about safety and security. And the best example to bring up is of a car, where you have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, you have a lot of in-car entertainment, which is exposed to spam and advertisement. You could have hacking for your engines. Your personal data could be hacked. Your key fobs could be hacked. In the UK these days, it's, it's, it's a common thing that cars, when they're parked outside, a bunch of hackers just drive in with a laptop and they listen into the frequency of the key that is being transmitted to the car. And as soon as they get hold of the frequency, they can actually clone the key and drive off with your car. It's actually something happening in 2020. So this story here is actually the story how a hacker broke into thousands of accounts belonging to users of two GPS tracker apps, giving him the ability to monitor the locations of tens of thousands of vehicles and even turn off the engines for some of them while they were in motion. Just imagine, one hacker has access to such a huge chunk of data and not just data, he's actually able to use that data to cause harm. You know, it was able, he was able to actually track vehicles in a handful of countries around the world, including India. And on some cars, the software has the capability of remotely turning off engines or vehicles that are stopped or are traveling at 12 miles per hour. This is pretty serious business. I have tons of other stories that I can't cover today in this talk about big car manufacturers not being able to close down all their security concerns before the car hits the road. So a lot is at stake, whether it's a mobile phone or a car or a rocket or a plane. Um, we just heard about this tragic accident in Karachi. Um, the PIA uh, aeroplane uh, couldn't get its landing gear uh, open. It was an Airbus. Um, and we hear about these stories, in fact, every day. Um, let's talk about another big security event, if you haven't actually been following that. It's a meltdown and a specter. So they came into light in early 2018, and they are two related side channel attacks against modern processors that can result in unprivileged code for reading data it should not be able to. Unprivileged means the only a privileged user should be able to get access to a bunch of code sitting in a certain secure area of the processor, but a hacker can potentially obtain that information. And most devices from smartphones to hardware in data centers your desktop PCs, almost everything was affected. IBM, AMD, Intel, ARM, all manufacturers. In fact, the US Congress had summoned the guys at Intel and AMD to actually ask them what the hell was going on. So in the worst case, the case code running on a device can access areas of memory. It does not have permission to access. This can result in a big compromise of sensitive data, including secret keys and passwords. This wasn't a unique event, and actually since that event, a lot more such attacks have surfaced. And this is again an ongoing story, and, and the hardware design companies are fighting tooth and nail to try and close these gaps. But you know what? It's all happening in, in like, oh, we didn't get it right, now let's go firefight it, fix it. This is something that shouldn't happen when you've got big companies with big investments. We should be producing things correctly, secure, and safe. Right, sorry. Um, so moving on, 
Reliability alone is not the biggest of the challenges. Now what we've got is liability issues. So we've got now DO254, which is a standard that affects the design of airborne electronics uh, and vendors who are manufacturing components that are going into airborne uh, things like rockets and planes have to conform to a certain standard. ISO 26262 is a standard for automotive, for cars. Anyone who's producing anything that goes in a car has to conform to the standards. The idea of these standards is to increase reliability, but a lot of this actually is also about liability and where you can actually put the blame if something was to go wrong. For security, there is an active standard being developed as we speak. Uh, IEEE is, is, is heading this effort and people are now trying to work out such a standard for security. So now you can imagine, you, know, you don't have to just build things right from a reliability point of view, you have to also think what if you got sued uh, later on. So what I'm saying is, if you actually focus on good methodology, good design discipline and good verification discipline, there's a, there's a lot that we can actually gain and get it right first time. So what I'm talking about here is formal verification. So what is formal verification? It is actually mathematics in automation, okay? So there are three flavors of formal verification. So it's traditionally been theorem proving, model checking and equivalence checking. The basic concept in formal verification is the use of mathematics and mathematical logic, like the kinds of what mathematicians do in discrete maths and set theory, and actually using proof rules to de devise proofs about correctness. The word formal here signifies that actually there is a systematic application of maths and logical rules to obtain the correctness. So Dijkstra came up with this quote in the 70s that program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. And he said that I'll argue that our program should be correct, that debugging is an inadequate means for achieving that goal, and that we must prove the correctness of programs. I shall argue that we must tailor our programs to the proof requirements, and I shall argue that programming will become more and more an activity of mathematical nature. Dijkstra said that in 70s. It's actually happening. The notion of a mathematical proof has been the cornerstone of formal methods, and this was also one of the reasons why formal had a hard time in getting adopted, because there weren't enough mathematicians and mathematical minds that were actually working in industry, either in software or hardware field. But theorem provers are powerful tools, no capacity limits, no, and they can actually verify the biggest of the biggest systems. But there's no ability to produce a trace to say why there was a bug in the system. You just, if you cannot prove a particular theorem because you're missing lemmas, then that's pretty much it. But you can't actually get any feedback. And training can be a big challenge, especially if you're not a mathematician. So the history for microprocessors has been a fascinating one from 1950s, where you have the first computer generated proof to Stanford Pascal Verifier, to then ACL2, one of the most well-known theorem provers from 1970s, to a whole family of theorem provers that came out of Stanford, Edinburgh, and Cambridge, and later on Munich, um, the whole Hall family, higher order logic family of theorem provers, down to their applications to microprocessors, compilers, full operating systems are being verified with theorem proving today. So we've come a long way, but the user base is still quite small, actually. Um, there's a fascinating book by Freak White, The 17 Provers of the World. Uh, I recommend if you um, like to read a lot more about this, feel free to look at that. Model checkers are bug hunting machines that build proofs through exhaustive state-space search. They're very powerful tools, easy to learn, and great for debugging But they do suffer capacity limits because they go through exhaustive state-space search. The history of model checking is equally fascinating. It started all in 1970s. Um, modern uh, temporal specification languages, LTL and CTL, started to emerge. Actually, the history of temporal logics is further beyond. 
you know, it goes back to the times of philosophical logic and epistemic logic and modal logic. Uh, people were talking about the logics of time. But in its most recent incarnation, 1970s is a good time to put your finger on it. And in 1980s, we were talking about very fine designs for 10 to the power 20 states. And then in between 1980s and 1990, we went to 10 to the power 100 states. And then in the era, you know, towards the millennium, bounded model checking was born, probabilistic model checking was born. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about now in 2020, actually, um, is verifying systems with more than 10 to the power 300,000 states. In fact, we at Axiomize recently verified a design with 1 billion uh, gates, which is about 338 million flip-flops. So it's 2 to the power 338 million uh, reachable estates. So that is how big a system we can actually verify with formal. I just wanted to highlight that I mentioned strategic cat labs at Intel, this was also a key artifact in the development of formal verification tool chain. In 1995, Intel started to build these tools. Till date, all of the Intel processors, microarchitectures are verified using tools that were built around that time or from 1995 onwards, especially the arithmetic verification. So there's a lot that has been going on in the field in, the, in abstraction, induction, and SMT solvers, BDD solvers, AIG, and inverter graphs, you know, binary decision diagrams. I can't go into detail, but I just wanted to mention these things in case you wanted to go into these at a later point. Um, dozens of model checkers, including four big EDA players, Synopsys, Cadence, Mentor Graphics, and one spin, nearly $100 million plus dollar industry, and all sorts of designs are being verified with model checking. Right, equivalence checking, again, a powerful technology can have capacity limits, but debugging learning is easy. The idea there is you compare two models, uh, one through combinational equivalence checking, and the other is through sequential over time. And half a dozen commercial EC tools exist today. Uh, mostly the application of EC has been in synthesis verification, where people convert their Verilog and VHDL models into gate level. Okay, so let's explain what's happening when theorem proving is in action. So we assume that there is a domain of three values represented by this set, and they consist of false, which represents the value zero in digital design, the value true, which denotes the value one in digital design, and an X, which denotes an unknown. So we can now model a D-type flip-flop without a reset, with an input D and an output Q, by actually employing a mathematical function. And we define this as a DFF, defined over the input node D, for a given sequence sigma. At time t plus 1, the value of Q would be the value of sigma applied at the previous time point t for the input D. And at time point 0, DFF returns an unknown value because the flip-flop is not reset. So a flip-flop in digital design is usually denoted by this diagram where D is the input and Q is the output. And it's when the rising edge of the clock, the value of D is transferred over to the output value. And notice that sigma here is a function from time to names to a value in one of these three uh, value in one of, uh, in, in the set. So DFFD is now a function that takes sigma and returns sigma. So DFFD is a higher order function. And this is a common way of modeling uh, software and hardware components in higher order logic uh, theorem provers. So let me now show you um, what happens when you actually execute this d-type flip-flop on a given input sequence. So if an input sequence sigma prime at time point zero for the input d is a value false and at time point one it's true and so on and so forth, then what we can do is when we apply DFF on this input sequence sigma prime with this input d, then at time point zero the value of q would be an unknown because it's a non-reset flop. But at time point one, 
it would be the value of t at time point zero. So this false simply moves over here. This true moves over here because at time point two, the value of q is the, is the value of d a cycle earlier. So this is how a single cycle delay d type flip flop works. Now what happens if we actually want to compose two d type flip flops back to back? We can do this by actually just applying the sequential composition operator in set theory onto these functions d of f imp, and you get now a two cycle delay. If we do n compositions, we get an n cycle delay. So on a two cycle delay, we are simply going to be delaying the input values on the output by two cycles. And that's pretty much how the flip-flops uh, and other such hardware components are modeled and executed in whole. Right. Model checking, I've already talked about uh, being automated, uh, state-space search algorithm, um, and whenever the failure is found, when a specification is not valid, the model checker stops and reports a failure. But when no failure state is identified and the entire reachable state space has been searched, then the specification is said to provably hold of the implementation. Model checking is a systematic search state space search algorithm. Step by step, breadth first, it expands its search cone. Simulation, on the other hand, is completely random. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. It goes all over and then tries to do, um, you know, tries to go and find bugs. So just wanted to make a comparison point between the two words. I talked about equivalence checking, so I'll skip it for now. It's, it's about comparison of two models and it can be done combinationally and sequentially. Right, so property checking in a nutshell, you start with a specification, you then transform this into constraints, assumptions that you would like to enforce on your inputs, and claims about behaviors on the outputs and the internal states through assertions and covers. You then use the same specification to build your design. So this is some Verilog code that is being shown here as an example. The constraints and the assertions are transformed into a machine-readable syntax, which is uh, system Verilog assertions here. This is saying that at every positive edge of a clock, every time I have a request, one cycle later, there is no request. And I then ask the tool to prove that if every passage of the clock, if there is an acknowledgement, um, can I also have the acknowledgement in the future? In this case, the design and the specifications, the assumptions and the assertions are fed into a tool, formal tool, and then it comes up with a pass or a fail or a question mark. The question mark itself is saying, we ran out of time, we ran out of compute memory, we couldn't tell you if it was a pass or a fail. A pass means that this assertion was exhaustively true on all reachable states of this design. Okay, so model checking actually occupies a much bigger uh, chunk of uh, verification uh, user space. Uh, but let's talk about RIS-5. Okay, so RIS-5 processor verification is, the, is an exciting case study because RIS-5 is becoming very, very popular. And you just have to notice from the slide that Kelster Redman presented in the RIS-5 summit is that from 1980s to today, there's an exponential growth uh, of processors. Previously, processors used to appear in devices that look like these. Now processors appear in watches, in cars, everywhere. So RISC-V is poised to significantly grow rapidly over the next five years. Uh, Semico Research predicts the market will consume a total of 62.4 billion RISC-V CPU cores by 2025, with the industrial sector to lead with 16.7 billion cores. <laughs> This is a revolution that's happening around the world. Uh, RISC-V Foundation has got more than 525 members across 33 countries around the world, 53 chip vendors, um, memory and network and storage providers, fabs, design services, research labs, software companies. This is a revolution that is happening because RISC-V is the fifth generation of the RISC architecture, which is completely open sourced so anyone can actually build a specific processor based on this open standard. A lot of the companies are involved in this. We are members of the Open Hardware Group, which is a collection of a lot of big names, and we are participating in the verification activity. 
So why is verification hard? Now, industry data suggests that any verification consumes nearly 70% of the time. Uh, so why will RISC-V be any different? And who's going to verify these processors? How will they be verified? It might be one thing to design a processor for free, but verification is a completely different ball game. So what is a processor anyways? So at its most simplest form, it has a control unit like this. It's called an instruction memory from where it reads instructions to decode like this. It has a data memory from where it reads the data on which the instructions perform operations such as the arithmetic logic unit operations. So you have adders and it's sort of subtractors. Um, and you have register files where the results of the computations are saved. So at its most basic form, this is how a processor looks like. And it's got a program counter that keeps track of the next instruction that's going to be decoded. However, modern processors are much more complex. And it's not just functional verification that actually is the, is the problem. They're massively optimized. We use heavy pipelining. So at any one point of time, one instruction might be decoded. Another one might be getting fetched. Another one might be getting executed. Then you've got interlocks, forwarding, branches, jumps, exceptions, stalls, interrupts, debug, extensions, clock gating, arithmetic, power, safety, security. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are all of these aspects of chip design, processor design, that's actually making verification much harder for S5. The challenges actually span the architectural layer. So we want to check that all instructions in the instruction set architecture, your loads, your stores, your ORs and the ANDs are actually working as expected. And only those instructions that are part of the instruction set architecture are implemented no more. The micro architectural side, which is design optimizations do not introduce bugs. So there should be no functional bugs, no deadlocks, live locks, etc. But at the same time, we want to talk about safety, security, power, and the concept of X checking when you have unknown states in the design that actually end up being unknown at the output of the, of the processor. And all of these verification concerns are completely intertwined with each other. So if you have a problem in safety, it might actually affect security. If you have a problem in either one of them, it may affect the other. So this is a diagram that shows how these things are layered on top of each other. So you may have a microarchitectural bug like a deadlock that might affect power or a power issue affecting deadlock. Or a lockstep verification when two processors are meant to work um, in tandem, but one is out of step with the other. Security issues can impact all the others. So this is a diagram that shows the overlapping of concerns. We are not showing um, that X propagation is the biggest verification concern, but we're saying that it is overlapping with these others. Right, because cores have bugs, um, Miroslav Velev in the International Test Conference in 2003 talked about a range of bugs that uh, his students had uh, found and they had in introduced during the chip design. And all of these are actually bugs that are not just found in designs that are made by students, but actually they're bugs that are found by people in industry. Um, so simulation is not adequate because it relies heavily on finding the right stimulus to feed into the design um, and it is very random so you're kind of depending on luck to find bugs whereas formal is very systematic and it actually likes to go through things in a, in a very breadth oriented breadth first oriented manner so it's much more likely to find bugs every time it does an expansion of the state space, it's, it's finding all of the states that are reachable you know, from the cycle before. And that could be a huge ton of states. So too many dependencies and scenarios to cover exhaustively with simulation. Uh, so conventional verification of microprocessors have, has traditionally relied heavily on architectural testing, uh, but you know, do instructions work as expected? So if I have a subtraction instruction working on register eight and nine, right? Um, is it actually doing the subtraction correctly? Um, similarly for add, and even for a small process, we're talking about 32 registers, right? So for 60 plus user instructions, just figure out how many combinations you will have to test before you can say that each instruction works correctly on all possible registers. And how about verifying certain optimizations do not break the functionality? So for example, if you have or XOR and AND, 
and the OR instruction is trying to and oh, sorry to OR the, the the operands in registers 14 and 25, and it's going to store it in register one. But look, before the the result of this is committed, um, before the before the results are committed to register one, they have to be read by um, the instruction XOR. And subsequently, the, the computation of XOR on register one and register zero when it's sitting in register 11, uh, the AND instruction is waiting to read the operands out of X11, uh, the 11th register. And, and the problem is that it's a big dependency. And before the results are made available from the execution of the previous instruction, the following instruction is waiting to operate on it. So processors use uh, things called data forwarding to actually make sure these things work correctly. And this is where uh, one source of bugs can easily appear. So realistically, how many combinations can be tested? So formal verification comes to the rescue. So we've designed our proof kit, which is actually uh, meant to be vendor neutral. It's easy to use. It's predictable, scalable. And the idea is that it can scale to bigger processors. The results should always be available in a fixed amount of time, and it should be easy to use. And it should work with any formal verification tool vendor. So we have leveraged the open source ISA to build architectural checks for functional correctness, security, safety, and power. And we've built automated flows and checks to verify deadlocks, lockstep, and X propagation. And additionally done checking on microarchitectural checks finite state machine checks powered interfaces. So our flow basically uses a RISC-5 ISA published specification. We then turn them into automated properties and then we can configure this automated uh, tool of ours using the specific design that needs to be verified using a setup file. And then our proofs uh, properties are sent into a formal tool along with the design and the tool then produces scenarios where it says I found a bug or it can say I found proofs. And when it does find proofs, it shows you which properties have been proven. Um, so we've actually uh, formally verified a range of processors um, and you can actually um, catch bugs. You can prove full bug absence and demonstrate full ISA compliance. The best thing is the user doesn't have to write a single line of verification code. And our formal verification methodology remains a key. So they're easy to use, powerful performance, and works with all major tools. Uh, so we've worked on several cores designed by the Perl Platform Group, and we've looked at two particular cores, Zero Risky and Micro Risky initially, but later on also looked at a core called IBEX, which is currently in the development at a company called Low Risk, which is funded by Google. Uh, it's based in Cambridge, and we found tons of bugs in these processors. So I'm not going to go into a lot of details. So this is a snapshot from Mentor Graphics where um, 50% of the proofs on uh, IBEX processor was, were finished within 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes, exhaustively proven, right? Beat that with any other verification. In two hours, 80% of the proofs were finished. So we found 90 plus bugs in zero risky, 60 plus in micro risky, and about 65 bugs in, the, this is the snapshot from July of last year in IBEX. Um, and wherever we were able to find the bugs, we were also able to say why it was a bug. Okay, so let's talk about summary as time is running out. Um, I would like to just summarize the key uh, aspects of what I talked about today. So what I've said is that bugs are a natural consequence of designing chips and human beings make mistakes. The problem is not in making mistakes, but the problem is in not being able to catch these mistakes, these errors, soon at the time of design, which is what we're saying we can do with formal verification. And the sooner we catch our bugs, the quicker it would be to fix them and cheaper it would be to fix them. So if bugs are caught late in the design cycle, then the, it results in a very expensive fix and the failures are catastrophic. Um, formal enables designers as well as verification engineers to reason with the same precise specification uh, and designers use this specification to build designs and verification engineers you will use the same specification to verify the design. So this process of using properties to capture requirements in a formal way allows designers and verification engineers to speak the same language. 
It usually takes a few days to get productive with formal verification. With our training, it's we're talking about less than a week. Um, so we use formal to find bugs and prove that they don't exist in designs with as big as one billion gates. Uh, this particular design had 338 million flip-flops, which in terms of the state space is two to the power 338 million, which is a ginormous uh, number of states. And to be able to prove the correctness of designs as big as this is an awesome uh, feat for formal. So I say to you, let us vaccinate our chip designs using formal verification. And on that note, I would like to thank you for your time and listening to me. And I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much.